I'm going to try to explain the Riemann hypothesis. And the Riemann hypothesis simply starts by asking what if you add 1 over 1 to the power of s plus 1 over 2 to the power of s plus 1 over 3 to the power of s. Yeah, you can see the pattern here. We just go on like that. And you ask for what values of s will this whole thing, and you call this whole thing the zeta function. For what values of s will this become equal to 0? Now there's a complication here. S is just a, not just an ordinary number. S is something called a complex number. And a complex number consists of two parts, a real part and an imaginary part. The real part is just a number that we know like 2 plus, and then there's an imaginary part, for example, 3i. So now we need to know what i is here. And i is simply defined as i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And then you might ask, why do I need a square root of negative 1? Well, we invent new things, new symbols, because we have problems we want to solve. So, for example, we have a class of, of normal numbers, whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then you say, well, what is 3, negative 5? And then you invent, you can't answer that with a whole positive number, so you have negative numbers. And you can ask yourself, what if I take 1 divided by 2? Well. The whole numbers are not enough then, you have to have integers, and you have to have um, decimal numbers. Uh, so, so you invent new things um, when you have problems, and the problem you want to try to solve with imaginary numbers is what is, for, for instance, a square root of negative 4? Well, square root of negative 4 could be something like square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1 which is the same as the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1, which is the same as 2 times, and we just defined i as the square root of negative 1, so that's 2i. So now we have a solution to the question of what is the square root of negative 4? It's 2i. So it's just a symbol we have invented in order to solve problems. So we have a complex number, which consists of our imaginary part 2, and now, so, sorry, a real part 2 and an imaginary part 3i. And we can also write this number down, actually, um, if you want to. So 2 plus 3i, say you have real axis here and imaginary axis here. So you would go 1, 2, you would be here, and 3i, 1, 2, 3, here. That's where we have 2 plus 3i. Okay, so now we know what a complex number is, and this is what we're putting into the s here in the zeta function. But the question is still, for what values of s, when you have a complex number, will this whole thing be equal to zero? And if you try it out, it turns out that, for example, when s is equal to, the real part is one half plus 14 and something i, then this whole thing becomes equal to zero. Also, when s is equal to 1 half plus 21i, then it becomes equal to 0. Also, when s is equal to 1 half plus 25 and something i, then it becomes equal to 0. And you start seeing a pattern here, right? You see that whenever the real part of the complex number is a half, then you get a 0. It's always the case that the real part is 1 half, when you have a zero. You never have uh, 0 0.75 plus 14i, for example, and then you get zero. No. So this means that if you draw it on, on this complex plane here, all the solutions that we have found so far to the Riemann hypothesis are on this line when the real part is equal to 1 half. And that's basically the Riemann hypothesis. It says that every single solution to the See the function being equal to zero here, then s will have the real part equal to one half. And all the examples we have found so far, that's the case. But we haven't proven it. No one has ever said it's impossible that we could find a solution here or here. But so far, all the solutions we have are here. But we have to prove that that's the case, and we haven't done that so far. That's why it's still just a hypothesis. Now you might ask, so what? <laughs> and that's an important question. Um, well, it's an important mathematical question, but it turns out that the zeta function is related to another question, which is the number of primes. How many primes are there below a certain number? And the zeta function is related to that question. 
So if you can solve the zeta function and prove the Riemann hypothesis, you can also get some important insights about the number of primes. And prime are like the building stones of numbers. Um, so that could be a major breakthrough. Thanks.